Hooray, here we are. Um, it's Mark Littlewood from Business of Software. Welcome to a much anticipated hangout. Uh, this is with Gail Goodman, who has been for many years, in fact, before SAS was even a thing, the CEO of Constant Contact. We have just got back from Ireland where we ran the third Business of Software Europe a couple of weeks ago. Had a fantastic time. Um, met some amazing people and some, some brilliant talks. I think at least three of them from memory reference Gail's talk she gave at Business of Software 2012, which we come up with this concept of uh, negotiating the long, slow SaaS ramp of death, which uh, sounds very, uh, very sad, but uh, it's been one of the most uh, well-received and, and, and well-regarded talks we've, uh, we've ever had at BOSS. And so we're delighted to uh, have Gail for this uh, Ask Me Anything Hangout. So, um, Gail. Hi. How are you? I am good. I am good. Great. Um, so let me let me start by asking you what you've been up to because I would think of you as Gail at Constant Contact, but um, things have changed. Well, things have certainly changed quite dramatically for me. Um, in February, we closed the acquisition of Constant Contact by Endurance International Group, and uh, I became a free agent. I've been using. Fantastic. It is fantastic. Uh, the team at Constant Contact is still uh, helping small businesses and growing the business and uh, in a different environment, but one where we have they, we, still still having trouble with my pronoun, <laughs> uh, where they have access to an even better kind of funnel of new businesses. Uh, most folks don't know Endurance, but what they are is a website hosting company. They operate under 40 different brands. You might know some of their brands like Bluehost, HostGator, iPages, uh, Homestead. And that means that they're getting hundreds of thousands of small businesses setting up websites. And so it's a natural next step to introduce them to marketing tools. So it's going to be a great fit for Constant Contact. So that team is off and running. And I'm taking some time to really re-engage with the startup community, mostly in Boston. Uh, been mentoring with tech stars, been getting involved with Mass Challenge. Uh, at the same time, joining a few boards. Uh, just joined the board of MindBody, which is a public software company that helps do the back office and increasingly the front office for yoga studios and fitness centers. I'm on the wow. board of Lola Travel, which is uh, reinventing travel with a um, chat app that is backed by humans. So the travel agent goes mobile and a couple other things. So I'm keeping busy and mostly in online SaaS and subscription models where I feel quite at home. I bet you do, I bet you do. So I'm gonna ask you to just give, you, uh, give us a little bit of a, a potted history of uh, your career and what you've what you've done and and, and before I do that um, two things if you're if you're watching uh, we love getting some questions and some um, some interactions from people so you can either tweet questions use the hashtag boss 2016 um, or you can just tweet directly to boss conference uh, and we'll uh, pick those ones up or click the Q a uh, button I think it should be on the left hand side of your screen if you're watching um, and then you get to ask questions and you can vote on other people's questions and things so um Gail let's just start off by by asking you to to give us a bit of background about your career and and, and how you ended up in SAS what a stupid place to be selling to <laughs> small businesses huh it's never going to yes. take off no it's not going to take long um so you know I and it's always hard to describe how far to go back, but my career grew up through software companies. I'd call it in inverse size proportion, from big to smaller to smaller to smaller. Um, you know, started, I'm, I'm so old, I started in uh, enterprise ERP, mainframe transition to mid, you know, to mid-range servers, to client server, all the way to, um, you know, the internet really starting to take off as a new software delivery model in the 90s. And in um, 
just before the constant contact run was at a company that was doing early internet commerce software called open market sure at open market um, and i had come up really through product management to running all of marketing to being a general manager of a piece of the business at open market one of the pieces of business i was running at open market was helping small businesses get online stores up and running and I got just fascinated with how the internet was going to change the ability for small businesses to compete. Yeah. And as I transitioned out of open market, I met a guy named Brandy Parker and a small team that was building email marketing for small businesses. And they were out looking for a CEO and I was uh, ready to take on a CEO role. I hadn't done it before. They were uh, pre-product, pre-revenue, pre-funding. So it was kind of six people and a alpha beta product and a great idea. And I joined that team and we raised multiple rounds of venture, sort of figured out how to scale a business at $30 and then $35 a month. That's what I called the long, slow SaaS ramp of death. Yeah. Woohoo, 100 customers, $3,000 a month. Right. took a really long time to get that to scale, but ultimately we scaled it to the point where when we sold it, we had 650,000 customers and 360, I think it was 8 million in revenue, $47 at a time, which wow. is just unbelievable that you, you know, and all along we heard, you'll never get it to scale. You'll never get it to scale. Learned a lot about scaling, which was as much about go to market, how you reach customers and onboard them and build a SaaS funnel as it was about great product and a great product experience. You need both. Uh, and then along the way, learning how to scale a team and how to scale myself as a CEO from startup CEO to public CEO. So lots of lessons along the way, you know, 16 and a half years uh, building that business to scale and then ultimately selling it. Wow. So how did you, how did you know you were ready to be a CEO? I'd, I'd love to, I mean, and this is something that people always uh, get interested in and, and there's sort of two types of people. There are people that, don't know that they're not ready to be a CEO, so they found a business and they become the CEO, and off they go. And sometimes they fly, and sometimes not so much. Um, but um, you've obviously had a very, I mean, a very distinguished career and a very kind of thought through career. What was going through your head when you decided actually I want to be the boss? You know, I, I wish there was some profound logic associated with it. Um, <laughs> but, you know, what was really going on uh, was it was 98, 99, and just the startup of kind of internet startups was going crazy. And Open Market happened to be one of those places that assembled an extraordinary team. And so people were peeling off and becoming CEOs. I think in the end, we counted, I think it was 12 startups whose CEOs had open market DNA. Wow. But part of it was just seeing these guys, and I will say guys because they were all men, taking these CEO gigs and saying, well, gosh, if they can do it, I can do it. <laughs> Love it. So I wish there was more kind of rationale than that. I did have doubts still because I had not done a bunch of the functions, right? I had never run finance. I didn't understand cash flow. I'd never worried about HR, right? I'd been a functional leader suddenly taking on the CEO gig. Um, and in the end, actually, it took a little bit of a kick in the ass. Um, I was simultaneously looking for a CEO gig and just to cover my, you know what, interviewing for VPs yeah. of marketing. And I interviewed, I'll give this guy credit, with Chris Heidelberger at Channel Wave for his VP of Marketing. And in the final interview, he says, Gail, you'd be great at this job, but what are you doing here? You should have my job. Don't take a VP of Marketing job. And honestly, I needed that last kick in the butt. So I, I oh, every time I see Chris, I remind him that uh, he was the one who got me to take the risk and go for it. 
Wow. Um, and, and I suppose that I didn't mean that to be a kind of a, a boy-girl thing. My, uh, my daughter, who um, I've mentioned after your talk um, in 2012, is actually 13 today. So she's become a teenager, which is pretty scary oh stuff, quite frankly. <laughs> <laughs> now, she's, I would say, probably not one of those people that's ever going to lack self-confidence for whatever reason um but even even so i still see sort of uh, <laughs> um she's she's she, she thinks very hard about whether she can do something um and i don't I mean without sort of wanting to kind of drill into the difference you know, gender differences and and whatever the thing that you said was there are all these guys going out there and they could do it and you were like well i can do it too was that was that one of the sort of big motivators or you know i definitely um it was part it was definitely part of it and i do think there is a bit of a gender gap here that you see where women want to have all the credentials before they leap and men are willing to leap with confidence that they can figure it out i do think that is a gender difference and i'm not a kind of big fan of spending a lot of time on gender differences oh. But I needed a little more of a confidence kick in the butt than I think other kind of uh, men do. That's interesting. But I, but so I do think experience before being a CEO is helpful. Yes. <laughs> and, um, you know, I do see a young crop of CEOs um, who could use a little seasoning uh, mm. before uh, necessarily being in a position – I guess the question is whether you want to be a founder or whether you want to be a CEO. Yeah. And I do think kind of as you move from founder to scale CEO, having seen a few real businesses is kind of helpful to have models to look at. Yeah. So is this a is this a VC driven thing? Is this a valley thing? And if I'm if I'm cynical, I would say that VCs really want to invest in a young, inexperienced team because they can almost kind of get in there and control them and take them out of the business if they're not doing well and take a bit more of the business for themselves. Um, and maybe that's that's just far too cynical. There are a few <laughs> extremely successful CEOs and people look at the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world and that becomes the model for everyone else. But actually there aren't very many Mark Zuckerbergs. Yeah, there are, you know, again, there are, there are not very many Mark Zuckerbergs. And um, I think many would say the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world are better when paired with a Sheryl Sandberg. Because yeah. you bring the best of the kind of creative energy with some scale business skills. Um, I think VCs are very willing to fund experience as well. So I think that's... Um, it's neither fish nor fowl. Uh, I actually think they enjoy, uh, uh, you know, a, a, an experienced team with proven ability to scale is also very attractive to VCs. So they're they're equally attractive. I think um, young, fresh founders um, tend to be more disruptive in their ideas. Yeah. <laughs> so. You in sixteen and a half. Um, are you still there? Sorry, I seem I to. I am have... still here. Yes. Oh no, I can hear you perfectly now. Um, you just went very quiet for some reason, but uh, that's uh, that's fine. I was going to see whether we were getting um, questions in, so um, we have actually got a got a couple in. We've got some in on Twitter, but I mean, I do I do think that's an interesting. Thing. I'd, I'd just like to, before we before we start taking questions, um, look at your journey through Constant Contact because it was kind of, you sort of had a product, you had an idea, there was a market that wasn't very interesting to, or, or people didn't think of it as being very interesting. Um, and you've been CEO from that, essentially, I don't know how many people was it? It was a small startup. Six. Six people. And when you left, it was over a thousand, and uh, you know all of the other big numbers, and had gone through a Nasdaq IPO. That's that's quite a journey, and and most people would expect there to be several CEOs along that journey. 
journey? Yeah, you know, I think I was successful navigating through the various stages because I was, you know, both um, because I was very conscious of how the role of the CEO needed to change. And I was willing to understand what I needed to do differently and change my leadership style. So, you know, the, you know, the style that got you through the first stage isn't going to be the style that gets you through the next stage. <laughs> the same is true of the team. And honestly, I had more trouble with that because it was very hard um, to see people who had done so much for the business move on. And in some cases, they moved on on their own. In some cases, I needed to move them on. And that was even harder. Yeah. Um, because I feel this huge loyalty to the folks who got me here. But in the end, you know, I think what really helped for me was having such a strong commitment to the mission. Mm. So in the end, it was all about what was right for the customer and for the business and for the investors, right? Yeah. And I could see when the team started to suffer because one of my leaders wasn't making it to the next scaling stage. Yeah. So in the end, I could feel okay about the moves I needed to make because I was doing the right thing for the team. Yeah. But it's hard and not everybody wants to do it. Yeah. You know, so I remember my first head of engineering who uh, was just fantastic you know, would love to be so close to the product that his point of view was formed from his personal understanding of the customer, the product need, and the code base. Yeah. And as we went from one team to two teams to directors reporting to him, he was just really clear that it stopped being fun and started being yeah. administrative to him. Yeah. And I respected that. He knew what he wanted. I would say that I kept having mostly fun all the way through. <laughs> and I think that's the secret, right? Do what you're great at and do what you have fun doing. Yeah. And if you, you know, and be astute enough to know when what the company needs may not be what you're great at anymore. You, you're tired of adapting. You don't want to do what's necessary. It's okay. Yeah, yeah. Right. But then step aside gracefully. And I, I kept asking people if it was time for me to step aside, right? I was open to hearing, Gail, you're not scaling anymore. I never hit that point. I might have been getting close when we ended, but <laughs> th thankfully we never tripped over that wire. Wow. Uh, and I was able to kind of tie it up with a bow and hand it over to... Uh, my second in command, my CFO, who's now running it and running it very successfully. Yeah. So if you could have one of those years again, of those 16 and a half years, what was the one that was the most fun and you got the most out of personally? So I would say probably 2006. <laughs> it seems like 10 years ago. <laughs> well, you know, you hit a point. Well, hopefully you hit a point where you're the market share leader, you're in hyper growth, and everything's going up and to the right, and you can do no wrong. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> it never lasts, but it's good. <laughs> and I was so worried about the wheels falling off, I didn't pause and enjoy it, so that's why I want it back, so I can know how good it was. Oh, fantastic. What a great, what a great comment. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, okay, right. So um, a question in here from Sarah Younger. He's got a question. Um, select this and it will appear magically. So hi, Sarah. At, at what point would you recommend a web application business plan move from initial proposal to a VC startup offering? Well, of course, it always depends on how much capital you need to get to early scale. But if I could wave a magic wand and pick the perfect time, I would pick the time 
when you understand your customer lifetime economics and you're ready to pour the gas on the top of the funnel. So that was a lot of acronyms. Let me unpack them. So in a SaaS model, there's a cost to acquire a customer, whether they call it CAC or you know, customer acquisition cost or COA, you know, whatever. It, I'll use an example. It costs $100 to acquire a customer and they pay you $20 a month. So, you know, you kind of break even at five months. And then the question is, how long do they stay and how much do you make? And there's a bunch of magic numbers in here. But the goal is your lifetime revenue is more than three times the cost to acquire. If you can get to the point where you know that. And so what do you need to know? You need to know the cost of acquisition at small scale. You need to know what your revenue per month is going to be and what your attrition looks like, you know, and particularly over cohorts, because usually your early attrition is a little higher than your steady state attrition. And so you start to get a view of your lifetime, which equals your lifetime value. If you can walk into a VC and say, here's my cost of acquisition, here's my lifetime value, and if you pour a dollar in at the top, I get $5 out at the bottom, you're going to be able to get just really good traction because they understand exactly how you're going to use their money. Now, sometimes you just can't wait that long because it costs you so much to get initial traction, you got to raise money. But if you, you asked what's, what time I would recommend, that's the perfect time because they're just investing in scaling up. And to scale up, you have to go into deficit spending because it costs $100 to get that customer that paying you $20 a month. So for the first month, you're out 80 bucks. And so it's all about, you know, deficit spending at that point to pour, to pour gas on the fire. That's the perfect time to raise money. Yeah. And that's something actually that's, that's echoed by, I mean, anyone that's run a successful SaaS business. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think one of the one of the themes that came out of Business of Software Europe a couple of weeks ago was um, there were a number of people that felt they'd taken funding a little bit early, um, and I think that's that has been a an issue for a number of organisations over the last few years because venture funding and angel funding has been relatively easy to come by. There's been a lot of money invested. Uh, VCs, angels have been going nuts for SaaS, for this, for that. Um, and that is starting to change now as people are getting a little bit more worried about the kind of future funding um, and companies are kind of moving through and not getting to that, you know, big scale, 100 million revenue and, and more. Um, and so people are getting people are getting a bit uh, a bit choosier about um, what they're actually going to put money into um, I love the um, Joel Spolsky from from Stack Exchange was famously um, famously against the notion of taking venture capital until he took venture capital <laughs> um, and uh, of course he came over here I remember having dinner with him and, and, and saying hey Joel you, you used to be so kind of we do this on our own and we scale and we build the business. Uh, and now you've taken, you took quite a chunk actually, um, 20 million or something from Index. You were a great, great investor. Um, and I said, what changed? And he said, it was really simple. We got the business on our own account to a point where we had a machine. And when we put marketing money in here, we had more money coming out the other end and we could see that and we could replicate it and it was predictable. And we had, the luxury of getting to that point on our own and that means that we can build and keep control and now it's a question of scale um, not everybody obviously gets to that um, not everybody gets to, to, to that point um, now there's a couple of really interesting questions here that have come in on the twitters um, sort of relating to this um, so gail this is from henry someone or other He's HGLD on Twitter. I'm not going to risk touching it in case something breaks and the broadcast breaks. But were there times where you doubted the ongoing growth at Constant Contact and felt you plateaued? Well, there were definitely um, 
growth challenges as we grew. Some of that was just classic law of large numbers. Yeah. Um, and some of that was just changing market conditions. Um, you know, so I think we had like four things all start to happen at once. So definitely the law of large numbers, right? You know, <laughs> one, you know, once you get to a $90 million quarter to get growth, you got to get a lot of growth. Yeah. Second, um, we definitely saw that we had moved out of the early adoption phase of the small business market and we're having to get to the, you know, if you're a crossing the chasm fan, you know, the later majority and even some of the laggards in order to drive growth, particularly because we were operating in an economic environment where small business formation had stalled, right? These Again, the last 10 years have not exactly been good for small business formation. So our, our end market wasn't growing as much as we would like. And so we had to push deeper into the market. Plus, we were seeing the emergence of competitors, including some really good startup competitors who, who then got to scale. Um, plus, we were seeing the emergence of substitutes. So whether that was using Facebook or Twitter to communicate with your customers, where people were really believing that that might be a better channel. You know, I think over time, <laughs> it's really proven that it's not a reliable place to build uh, repeat customer relationships. It may be That's good. It's really strange because Twitter and Facebook say it's ideal. <laughs> well, we can go there if you want. Um, and then the final thing we were starting to see was people incorporating our core tools into broader suites where people were saying, well, geez, I already got email marketing with my back office solution. So we really had four different pressure points on growth. Um, you know, as we exited, we were still in the teens on growth, but we were starting to see that we would have trouble sustaining kind of the mid teen level growth as we wow. crossed, you know, 450 million to 500 million. Again, 10% growth on a $500 million business means you're adding 50 million in business, yeah. which, you know, it's just really hard to do. It's also hard in a SaaS business, even if you've got your attrition percentage going down, your absolute attrition numbers start to climb. So we were sub 2% monthly attrition, but that was starting to be 12,000, 13,000, 14,000 customers a month in absolute numbers we were losing. So we had to replace those before we could get to growth. And that okay. is definitely a law of large numbers SaaS problem. You know, that is just, you know, it's just the reality. Yeah. Wow. Um, so I don't know which one to take. That one's disappeared. So because um, there were a couple here that are related to that. How did you set targets that were realistic, but still challenging for your teams? Um, and you know, how did you keep hope and motivation up within the organization? I suppose in the face of the law, in, in the face of the long, slow SAS ramp of death. Um, again, both questions from Henry, and then we're going to go to Ivan. So, you know, we were obviously in the end well out of the long, slow SaaS ramp of death. We were, you know, past scale, well profitable, right? And when we ended, we were running about a, a 20% uh, margin. So, and very cash flow positive. So, you know, let's do the kind of setting realistic goals. So, I think a lot of that setting realistic goals starts from having a really great analytic understanding of your business. And in the SaaS market, there's no excuse not to. <laughs> Everything's happening online, <laughs> including your customer engagement. And if you are not able to really predict pretty darn well what's going to happen as you enter a year to your installed base, which ones are going to grow their revenue per month to you, how much attrition, you should be able to model that pretty darn well. And actually in your given year, 70 plus percent of your revenue is going to be the tail you bring in. Yeah. So then it really becomes all about modeling growth. 
And that again comes back to analytics. So you should have a pretty good view by channel of what it's currently delivering. My pay-per-click channel is delivering this many new customers per month and it has this kind of characteristics. My channel is currently delivering this much per month with these characteristics. So you got kind of revenue from the install base and then you've got current performance of your channels. And now you should be at 95% of your number. And then it's like, all right, now what new channels can I get or what performance improvements can I make to the existing channels? So again, in a SaaS business, it builds up in levels. Now the uncertainty is a relatively small band. And we got very good at sort of pushing every channel and every piece of the funnel into continuous improvement and giving each one uh, improvement goal, but not, you know, but adding to our company targets, not the sum of the whole, if that makes sense. Yeah. So you got 10 things that are going to improve, and if they all improve, you know, it'll generate 100. Well, budget 70. <laughs> but set the goals to each of the individual guys that give you 100. And now you've got room for some of your hypotheses for improvement to be wrong. And the truth is, they're all wrong. The ones that work, work even more than you think. And the ones that don't work, don't work at all. So they're all wrong, but you're taking a portfolio approach to growth, to growth planning. So that's how, that's how we set numbers. But again, remember, 95% is very predictable. 70% from your existing channels. The next 25% is coming from the proven productivity of your channels. And the only variability is where you expect those channels to expand or new channels to emerge or performance improvement inside the existing channels. So the other question was, how did I keep people excited during the long, slow SaaS ramp adapt? And that was pretty easy. We massively over-communicated to the team what we were doing, why we were doing it, why it mattered, and what the next metric was that we were trying to get to. And we kept those metrics pretty close in. So whether that was customer count or conversion rate or retention rate, everybody knew, like, if we can tweak this and tweak that, here's how it changes our lifetime customer economics and gets us into the happy zone where we can scale the business. And we were very transparent. Brilliant. Um, thank you. And I, there's a, a question to follow up on that, but I'm going to just answer this one from Sarah Younger. Um, will this be available to us afterwards as a recording? Through the magic of YouTube and, in fact, the much better Wistia, which is a fantastic um, Boston-based video hosting company that do killer analytics. Um, we've used them. They've, they've been to Boston on many occasions, and uh, we use them as a as a service and we'll uh, transfer this into our portfolio and let you know. So um, um, so that's a little plug for Wistia who don't give me any money for telling me they are awesome, but they are, and they should. Right, um, Ivan, Ivan I think is in South Africa, um, assuming he's got home because he was uh, over in Dublin a couple of weeks ago for Boss Europe. But um, his question perhaps inevitably is uh, which channel drove the biggest customer adoption? Maybe we should think about that as a two-part question. Where did you get biggest customer adoption in your early early phases, and where did you get it when you were a bit more mature? Because I'm, I'm guessing the two would be different. Perhaps yeah. not. Well, I think um, so. So when we started, um, probably our biggest customer adoption channel was just um, demonstrated by your uh, raving description of Vistia, um, which is uh, customer referrals were our biggest adoption channel. So when we started, you know, it was, uh, we focused on partners and um, online pay-per-click and then 
we started to get what I call kind of the referral tailwind pushing us. So for every customer we acquired by paid at our heyday, we were getting 1.9 incremental word of mouth referrals, which wow. is just crazy good. So one of the pieces of advice I give to everybody at the early stages of building a SaaS business is make sure you are delighting your current customers. It, it pays off in so many ways. It pays off with retention. It pays off with increased usage and it pays off with word of mouth referrals. And if you're not delighting your customers, I don't care how much you spend, you'll, it's hard to get to scale without a referral kicker. <laughs> and um, it's hard to get to scale because you won't get the conversion and retention you need in, in kind of in your model. So I'd say, you know, the biggest channel was word of mouth referrals. And by the way, we could never incent those effectively. So that's always the second question I get. What was your referral program? And we did have a referral program. If you refer a friend, you get a credit, they get a credit. Most people didn't bother with that. They referred their friends because they loved the product and it worked for them. And they people like sharing their expertise. So word of mouth referrals was always our biggest. It was our biggest from the start. By the end, it had definitely declined significantly. Now, part of that is because um, word of mouth referrals tend to happen in the early blush of a customer engagement. So customer finds you, they use you, and they're so excited. Think about you finding a new restaurant, right? This is a yeah. human nature thing. You're excited the first time and you go tell people, maybe the second time you tell a couple and the third time, hey, it's just your regular restaurant and you don't talk about it as much. So, you know, the size of the base versus the new started to be uh, less of a, more of a problem. The second was that it just gets harder to create a delightful product as your product gets bigger. So <laughs> when you start a product, it's usually like simple and clean. And then you've got customers who wanted to do A and customers who wanted to do B. And you start to add breadth of functionality, which makes it all clunkier and heavier. And you got to re-simplify. So there's a lot of challenges with keeping the excitement of customer of your customer referral engine going but referrals were always big online marketing was always a big channel even till the end pay-per-click then banner ads and facebook ads and kind of everywhere that online went we used um what's now called inbound marketing so whether mm -hmm. you know, education as a fundamental principle for how we created demand and that was certainly online stuff like blogs and webinars, but we actually extended that reach all the way to local seminars where we were teaching small businesses how to do marketing. Now, of course, with our tools, right? Sure. <laughs> and, you know, it wasn't an ad for our products. It was a marketing methodology, best practices seminar, but our tools were a great way to do that. And a lot of that was about are learnings that small businesses mostly learn in their own community. So we had to get local to reach them. Um, and then we used a lot of channel partners, particularly local web developers and local marketing consultants, but also channel partners like Endurance. And you know, what a surprise, one of our partners ended up being our exit, which often is you know, a great way um, to start to find the right home for your company over time. So those were our big channels. I would say they kind of matured as we went. Um, the, certainly our channel partnerships got more mature and a larger part of our business as we got bigger. Very interesting. What was the one that was, meh, what was the one that you just thought was going to be brilliant? It was like the one where, Everyone got really, really G'd up and thought this is going to be so cool and we've done it and it just went. Yeah, you know, um, there were a so lot. the technical term. <laughs> so we tried a bunch of models that never worked. Um, I'll, I'll focus on three of them. Uh, we were very big on comparing notes with other people, by the way. So 
we learned a lot of our success by imitating others. We weren't at the least bit upset about that. Uh, one, uh, you know, one of the companies we were comparing notes with was having immense success with what they call endorsement radio, where you go to these celebrity talk radio folks and they become users of your product and you kind of handhold them to be great users. And then they talk on the air about how great their, their experience was. It worked really well for a bunch of folks in the SMB space and it fell completely flat for us. Never really understood why. Invested a lot of money getting six celebrities up and running and it just didn't, didn't happen. We always believe direct mail. What sort of celebrities were they as a matter of interest? You don't have to name them. I can probably, people well, can probably uh, Google them if they want to. Yeah, so it's like Kim Commando, Rush Limbaugh, uh, you know, folks who had very big followings who listened to them. And they make all of their living off of this kind of endorsement of products. And it worked really well for some categories. Mm. Backup, online meetings, they do, you know, if you listen to them, they endorse a lot of products that are very successful. They're very successful at selling them. Didn't work for our product. Wow. Um, and by the way, they have a little bit of controversy associated with them because they're usually um, great talk radio folks because they're on one end or the other end of the political spectrum, which was just a thing we, yeah. a messy part of it that was just not as much fun. Because whichever side you're on, you're pissing off someone on the other side. <laughs> then you can uh, get Trump and Trump and Hillary. I'm not going there. <laughs> not going there. Uh, the other thing we so two other models we thought should work and tried and didn't work. Direct mail never worked for us. Uh, lots and lots. Physical of mail. Physical mail. SMBs are very easy to target. You can get a lot of data about who they are. And lots of businesses have done great using direct mail to small businesses. We tried it maybe a dozen times, never got the math to work. I think it was the complicated nature of our product. Uh, and then the third thing we tried a couple of times was door to door. So in person sales to SMBs works. You know, the Yellow Pages have done it for years. The phone companies have done it for years. You know, again, just never worked for us. Never got the math to work. Fascinating. Why do you think, because getting in front of people like that surely is giving you a, a, a good opportunity to have a really engaged dialogue with someone. Is it, is it just it's just physically too expensive to get those people through the door? Yeah, our average selling price was too low and the lack of understanding was too high. So we couldn't get it to a one visit close. It was always a two visit close. And a two visit close at a $30 or even a $50 average selling price just didn't work. So just couldn't make the math work. We could it did we could get people to close, but not at economics that worked for us. Got you. Okay, we're going to take another question here. Um, this is from Jeremy Moskowitz, who I think is coming to see you in September after a break of a couple of years. So, Excellent. <coughs> excuse me. Um, any ideas to market a B2B SaaS service? Our cloud service is mostly for businesses and enterprise IT departments, which is hard to break into. So I guess everything is hard to break into, first of all. <laughs> well, it, de it definitely is. Um, so let me, I don't know this area very well, so I'm, I'm kind of going into creative problem solving uh, live on the internet. It happens. Um, so this is clearly one where certainly in IT departments, people move a lot. So I do think we go back to that kind of delight the customer referral chain. Um, I think as you get a few or, you know, the first ones you are always hand to hand combat, but as you get your first ones, I do think get, you know, asking and encouraging them to share the word 
And in particular in the B2B space, that could, you know, that's very much using things like LinkedIn. If you think about an IT department, all of their LinkedIn colleagues are going to also be in IT departments. They're people they worked for before. So getting, you know, doing case studies with your best customers and then posting those case studies, you know, blogs and and Facebook, but I would predominantly look for LinkedIn and Twitter. And then asking the folks who are named in those to share them with their colleagues and so on, you know, could create some demand. Um, I definitely think, you know, case studies and ROI studies, the more, you know, in B2B, it's all about show me the money, right? If I use your yeah, solution, yeah. what do I get back? So using those tools um, to drive inbound. This is an inbound world. You're not going to cold call your way into this. It just isn't going to work. Um, which really starts with understanding what are the problems you're solving and keywords connected to those problems so that you are building um, content that is directly connected and easily found when people are asking questions that you have an answer for. I mean, it sounds fairly basic, so, but it's definitely, um, you know, an inbound game in this world. And the narrower and cleaner you can be about the problem you're solving and the ROI you return for that problem, the easier it'll be. But I, I feel like I was grossly generic in my answer to you, Jeremy, but it's because I don't know your business well enough. <laughs> so let's talk about inbound marketing a little bit because when you started doing that that was a new thing unlike any new thing um, it wasn't even named that <laughs> yeah. but now everyone's doing it and everybody wherever you go you're being you know you, I put something up on LinkedIn the other day and it said fantastic welcome to your content marketing journey now do this that and that's LinkedIn doing it I mean, it's just being pushed everywhere so it's getting harder and harder to find the good content. And if people are writing these sort of five jaw-dropping things that will turn your business around and number seven will leave you lying on the floor with amazement, it's very, very hard to kind of find the good content. And I find this increasingly as a consumer of a lot of content. Well, I hate to get back to my referral, um, say, you know, uh, soapbox, but um, I do think it's a quality, not a quantity game, and I think people get mixed up about that. Um, you are far better off writing two or three great pieces a month than writing three crappy pieces a week because people will zone you out. Less is more. So that's the other thing I kind of long for, you know, the good, the good news is nobody reads long form content. It's kind of a sad and pathetic commentary on our society, but let's leave that aside um, come back to, um, you know, if you stay close to your customer, I mean, really close to your customer, particularly your early customers, you will begin to have aha moments about sort of things they didn't understand before they started using your software or things you didn't understand that they needed to do. So whether that's, you know, here, you know, and it's easy to turn those into insights and write those up, right? So you know, the three misconceptions about implementing blah, blah software. You know, two things you should do to prepare before you start or whatever. Mm. I think it is, though, about the quality of the insight. And I do think um, as, you know, as marketers have adopted this as a methodology, they've um, got a little bit carried away. <laughs> no, I think they've forgotten that. Um, and I think from our earliest days, and maybe we just got a little lucky, you know, we realized that if our customers used our product well, 
they'd get better results. If they got better results, they'd stay longer. And we got very focused on what do they need to do to get better results? Like, how do you build a really great email list? Not just build a list, a great one. How do you write great content? What content works for driving conversion? And the more we stayed focused on the prize, which is customer success. So we always had a guiding light. When our customer succeeds, we succeed. So we weren't writing content to drive leads. We were writing content to drive customer success. Knowing that, that with the kind of gut instinct, which ended up being right, that in the end, that would drive leads. And I think it's all about kind of framing your content correctly. And then I think people find you. Does that make sense? Makes perfect sense. Very long answer, to be honest. Could you summarize it in 120 characters so I can tweet it? <laughs> Great content rules. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can. Um, oh, look, there's... Uh, Funny enough, I recognise this name, uh, Georgia Ringham, who uh, I think registered for um, Boss yesterday. So uh, we'll be seeing you in uh, September. This is a great, a great question, and it's a question that's quite dear to the hearts of lots of people, particularly in SaaS. And I know Patrick McKenzie, who's based over in Japan, came and listened to your talk at uh, Boss 2012. And I remember him tweeting something like. Um, there was something you said, and I can't remember what it was, but he said basically that was that one piece of information was worth the cost of his flight alone. So, um, and he is a huge proponent of the idea of putting up prices. <clears throat> I'm glad I'm not one of his customers. But, um, actually, no, I would like to be one of his customers. He provides a very good service, but uh, it's not one that we really need. Did you ever feel the need to increase the price of a service? So I guess the way I'd answer that is um, there's nothing wrong with increasing prices, particularly if you're increasing value. And we did over time, uh, you know, we went, we did one price increase really early where we were just trying to figure out the price point for the darn market, right? And the lower the, you know, it's always tempting to have a really low price, but then that can limit how much you can afford for cost of acquisition. And you may be better off trying a higher price. So at the beginning, we just experimented to figure out what the market will bear, particularly when you're early in the market and there aren't a lot of competitors. You might as like, our customers kept saying to us, like, I would pay three times what you charge. You add so much value. And we were like, well, Crap, if they'll pay more, let's try it. <laughs> so let me start with early on, pricing is half art, half science, and you got to kind of take a stab at it. So we took a stab at it, and then we were like, wow, we think we can charge more. So I remember it was 2004, we changed our pricing, which you know was a big gulp opportunity for us. We weren't sophisticated enough to put it in the test lane at that point. We had to go all in, and it worked. And then we stayed there for a long time. But then we began to understand that there was an opportunity through packaging to try other price points where, you know, as we went along, we kept adding new things. And every time we added a new thing, we had to ask ourselves, does that go into the base price or is that an add-on? And we started to have too many add-ons, which mm -hmm. so we like... We didn't move the base price, but then we had like, and you can add this and you can add that and you can add this and you can add that. And our price page started to look ugly and complex. Not to mention customers started to feel like we were nickeling and dining them because we had too many things to talk about. So then we just went to good, better, best pricing, which was a price increase. But we did it by good was the same base price as our original product. Better and best were bundles of add-ons that made logical sense based on where you were in your marketing adoption cycle, yeah. but gave us entry points that were higher and allowed us to virtually increase price. 
and do it in a way that felt very compatible to our customers. So the answer is yes, we increased price. We did it in a way that felt a little less than just a strict price increase. But there were a couple of places where we did strict price increases and we didn't feel bashful about it. I actually think we tried once to sort of not call it a price increase and customers were like, it's a freaking price increase. Just call it that. <laughs> so we did then just start to say every once in a while, like we did some price increases where we just wrote letters and said, you know, we haven't increased price in six years. Hopefully you've loved our software. We are moving it up this year and didn't apologize and it went okay. Did you lose many? Did you lose any? Did you? So we always forecasted attrition and always ended up getting almost none. Measured on hands, like 10, 15 customers out of uh, 50,000 base. It obviously always, like, you do the math and you were like, ooh, if 6% a trip, we're still better off. And it wasn't even a percentage point wow. increase in attrition. Wow. So people are stickier than you think they are, even in a competitive market. And in our world, it was a competitive market where many of our customers could get the same product for free, which yeah. is always makes you very, very frightened of price increases. Yeah, free is a very, it's a very hard price point, isn't it? Because you can never beat it. But people, people find it very hard. To, I mean, as consumers, people still find it quite hard to, to see through. and. People, yep. There are always people that will be happy to do something that's free, even though it costs them a huge amount of time or there's intrusion into their activity yep. or whatever it is. Yep. Good luck to them. Um, I can't believe it. We've got about three minutes wow. before we need to wrap up. I can't. I just, time oh, flies. It certainly does. I've got so many notes and things here. I don't know how we're going to kind of write that up into a. Uh, into a blog post or two, but uh, um, absolutely, yeah, absolutely brilliant. Uh, look, thank you so much for um, coming along and, and catching up. And, and more importantly, you're coming to see us in Boston in September, aren't you? So I am. What, I'm what, looking forward to it. What are we talking about there? So I think we uh, we said lessons learned. Yeah. And something that keeps it spectacularly open. I know. And I'm still thinking about exactly which lessons to focus on. So if uh, people are watching this and they have some ideas, I'd love to hear it. Um, I'm starting to form some ideas around what I'm going to call the SaaS 2.0 funnel. Oh. And uh, misconceptions and mismeasurement that I'm seeing from a lot of businesses. So I definitely... Um, I think people take the simple rules of thumb way too simply. Uh, so I think I might go there, but I might go with scaling lessons learned on the scaling path. I'm open to I'm open to input. That's fantastic. Well, I think I think certainly the lessons learned in, in scaling is a is a very powerful thing. But um, there is. Uh, just, just thinking about the misconceptions and mis mismeasurement, there are a lot of, a lot of people that are <clears throat> gurus of SaaS in whatever <clears throat> way who sit there and blog and tweet, and it's incredible how quickly things become the orthodoxy just because some key people have started to uh, talk about it. And I'm not picking on anyone in particular. I'm not having a go at anyone. It's, it's just fascinating how um people will hang on every word that someone someone has and then all of a sudden they're retooling their business to um chase after someone's ideas and and things move on you know i mean that's that's one of the great things about um business and about software and it, it's it's changing and there are new ideas and there are new things coming along so um i think that will be a very uh, a very interesting thing to touch on great Fabulous. Um, Gail, thank you so much once again. Um, it's thank always you. It's been a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Um, and a, and a real, um, it's a real education every time we, uh, we speak. So um, without any further ado, thank you so much for everybody for watching. And we'll put this up and write some blog posts about it. And uh, look forward to seeing Gail in September. Thank See you so much. everybody in September.
Take care. Bye-bye.